Ao ma chata stia hoke oke, kami shak batina, a shell shaker. I am an inholata woman, born into the tradition of our grandmother, the first shell shaker of our people. We are the peacemakers for the Choctaws. The story of the inholata begins a long time ago when grandmother was very young. The town where she lived was far away and near a river. Food was plentiful. Even grandmother's cabin was dripping with beans, made of green canes and lashed together with vines that had crawled out of the earth. Her cabin continually sprouted new growth. In the middle of the town's square grounds, where all the celebrations occurred, everything was wide open, like a party. Every day, the men sang with a drum in the square grounds while the women tended their children and drank from gourds filled with sweet peach juice. Life was a series of games and dances. The town champion of Toli, the stickball game, was our grandfather. His name was Tuscaloosa, black warrior, and he was a great leader, robust and dynamic. After the stickball games, which took many days and nights to play out, Tuscaloosa would dance with only one woman, our grandmother. They were so beautiful together. Their skin was smooth and their teeth were white and straight. They sounded alike so potent their voices could call the lightning. We were watery versions of them. There once was a road, an ancient trade route that began in the east, like the wind gathering, receding, returning. It went through hundreds of towns until it reached the middle of the square grounds where grandfather played stickball. Down this road came a terrible story. It said, a dangerous enemy has arrived on our shores with weapons of fire. He has camped a few days away in the town of Talisi. He will devour your family. Soon he will be on the move again. He's a very different kind of Osano, bloodsucker. He always hungers for more. When Tuscaloosa heard this, he and his warriors began to make plans to save the people from the invader. Because he was a well-known stickball player, he would be the one to lead the enemy into a trap. He realized he would probably have to die in order to lure the Osana away. It was then our grandmother did an extraordinary thing. She built a fire and she trapped, strapped the enemy shells of turtles or empty shells of turtles around each ankle. She didn't sing aloud because she was afraid the children would hear sorrow in her voice. So she moved only her lips in silent prayers. For four days and nights, she never stopped dancing around the fire, extolling the heroics of the man she loved. Amazingly, the fire did not go out. Miko Luak, fire spirit, was so spellbound by her story that he would not leave for fear of missing important details of Tuscaloosa's courage. On the fourth night, grandmother's ankles were swollen and bloody where the shells and leather twine had cut into them. The ground around the fire was red with her blood, but still she danced. And it was then Miko Luak took pity on her. He carried her prayers up to the Italuachi, the autumnal equinox, who listened with compassion. Italochi learned that grandmother had begun her cer ceremony on his special day of the year. What have you, you have endured confirms that you are sincere, he said. Through your sacrifice of blood, you have proven yourself worthy. The things you desire for the people will be given. Then he gave her this song and told her to sing it when she needed his help. Italochi autumnal equinox, on your day when I sing this song, you will make things even. After learning that Italucci had given his word to grandmother, our ancestors prepared for what was coming. The next 12 days were spent in ceremony. Tuscaloosa and his stickball players drank black drink and prayed around the fire. Grandmother taught her sisters the snake dance and how to imitate the movements of a coiling and uncoiling snake, a sign of power. She also showed the women how to tie on the turtle shells without cutting their legs. On the 13th day, all ceremonies stopped. It was time for goodbyes. Tuscaloosa put a tiny black stone in our grandmother's mouth and told her to swallow it. He said it represented his spirit. 
she presented him with a cosmo, a feathered shawl with locks of her hair woven through it. She told him the cosmo represented her spirit, and if he wore it, they would never be parted. That was what Italucci had promised her. The next morning, Tuscaloosa wrapped the cosmo around his shoulders and left to meet the invader, Hispano de Soto. His plan was to pretend to be captured by the enemy. Tuscaloosa allowed himself to be put in chains, and he bowed his head like a pitiful child. De Soto, the most greedy Osano, was able to reason that Tuscaloosa was leading him into a trap. He believed our grandfather was a coward who had surrendered without a fight. Unbeknownst to De Soto, the man standing before him was only a shell. All that grandfather had been, his essence, was held inside of grandmother for safekeeping. It was part of their sacred plan. For seven more days, in the month of Hashbisa, October, Hispano de Soto marched grandfather down to the town, marched grandfather to the town of Mabila. Along the way, grandfather's Ixa group surrendered to the Hispanos, but the Mabila, Mabilians, our clever cousins, were on the plane, plan to draw in on the plan to drive de Soto out of the region, and they entertained the invaders with a bountiful feast. Tuscaloosa and his stickball players waited for the signal to begin fighting. At the appointed time, Grandfather's shell reunited with his body, and the battle began. The stickball players fought bravely against the foreigners. The Hispanos attacked the walls of the Malibian, Malibian, cut, uh, Mabilian fort, cutting them down and setting fire to the houses within. The whole town was burned. Unspeakable acts were then committed by Hispano Asano. They fell into a barbaric bloodlust and cut off the heads and hands of the stickball players and the Mabilians. Later, the Hispanos displayed them wherever they went as souvenirs of their courage. Grandmother instantly knew something was wrong. The stone churned in her stomach and she vomited it into her hands. It had changed color from black to gray and had holes in it like a skull. And she knew Tuscaloosa was dead. Instead of crying for her husband, which was her duty, she gathered her six younger sisters and made a powerful speech. She said Tuscaloosa and his Ixa brothers gave their lives so the women and children would not become the slaves of foreigners. She told her sisters they would mourn their husbands after they were safely away from the invaders. All agreed, the women put away their sorrow until the time was right and they could properly mourn for the dead. Our grandmother sang the song Italucci taught her, and that's when it happened. A moment opened. A flurry of color took flight. Lips opened in awe, then transformed into multicolored beaks and wings. Voices thinned out and tangled in throats that turned into other voices. A song of birds. Grandmother and her sisters soared over the heads of the Hispanos and dropped excrement on them. Then they flew away. For many days and nights, people from other clans said that they saw a flock of strange birds crisscrossing the Apetan Nichi, the river that caused all life to rise up. When these variegated creatures reached our present homelands, their wings fell off. The sisters went back to the living according to customs went back to living according to customs. They built our seven original Choctaw towns. Yanibi town is one of them. After living through the horrors of warfare, grandmother decided she would become a peacemaker. She taught her sisters the art of negotiation and how to find solutions to disputes. She became well known as a leader who spoke for peace and the fair exchange of goods between towns. When grandmother's life came to an end many years later, Italucci kept his promise to her. She was strapped on her burial scaffold and released by the bone picking ceremony to join Tuscaloosa. Together they reside on high reside high on Holy Spirit's bluff. Sometimes they appear as eagles 
or the kettling hawks suspended in the sky. Other times they are the mated swans we see along the rivers and bayous. They have never left us. Because grandmothers shed blood for the people's survival, our women continue to honor Italucci by shaking shells. I am a shell shaker. I know when it is time to return to the earth. Today I will tear myself from the arms of my family and stand in for my first daughter, Analita, who has been wrongfully acu wrongly accused of the murder of a Chickasaw woman from the Red Fox Village. I will sacrifice myself, knowing that peace will follow between our two tribes. I study the expressions of the Inolata gathered in my yard. They seem cold and indifferent to the fact that the Red Fox people are waiting outside of our town to conduct my execution. Everyone knows what must happen now. My death will avert war between the Choctaws and the Chickasaws. I can see uncertainty spreading across Analita's face. Like an affliction. She is my first daughter and bears all the responsibility of heading our clan after I am executed. Her thick hair is matted and hangs in clumps down her back. Already, Analita mourns me, although my death blow has not been struck. A few might want to blame her for what is going to happen, so I must keep talking until all the Inholata people agree to support my decision. They must also publicly say that Analita is ki innocent of killing the Chickasaw woman. This will guarantee that in the future she will be thought of as an honorable leader. In a way, I am responsible for the disaster at the Red Fox Village. I had sent Analita to them as an emissary of our town. I was still recovering from the English Okla disease that had killed so many of our people. She was to exchange vegetable seeds and bowls filled with special healing plants for flints. Then something strange happened. A woman accused Analita of stealing the affections of her husband. Both women had known for a long time they were married to the same man, so I don't understand her actions. It is not unusual for warriors to marry women from different towns as long as they can provide meat for both families. But when the woman from the Red Fox Village was found dead the next morning, the people said Analita was the killer. I did not know at the time this incident would affect my family for generations to come. I wait for a public reply from the Inolata. Why are they so hesitant? I've talked with everyone over the past month. I have explained repeatedly why my death will assuage the Red Fox clan and Chickasaws. Don't they want to avoid bloodshed? When I can stand their silence no longer, I begin to chant loudly. Hatak oklahot akchaya bila holili bila. The people are ever living, ever dying ever alive. Hatak okla hut akchaya bilia ho ili bila. The people are ever living, ever dying, ever alive. Finally, one old aunt, too old to stand, returns my chant from her seat at our council fire. Hatak okla hut akchaya bilia ho ili bila. Then another woman and her brother join in until all of my clan some 70 people began chanting, Hatak okla hut okchaya biliaho ilia bila. Hatak okla hut okchaya biliaho ili bila. Hatak okla hut okchaya biliaho ili bila. Hatak okla hut okchaya biliaho ili bila. Very well, I say, we are ever liver, living, ever dying, you agree. If that is so, you must support me and honor the traditions of the first shell shaker, the oldest of seven sisters, our savior and creator, grandmother of birds. I fold my arms and again wait patiently for a relative to stand up and praise my strategies for saving Analita and averting war. They must declare my daughter's innocence and vow to protect her, but they sit silent as owls. I sniff the gray stone. I hold it in my hand, the one that belonged to grandmother of birds. It smells of sediment and potato roots and other things I carry in my satchel. 
After the bone picking ceremony, all my possessions will be divided among my daughters. My essence will be mingled with theirs, as it should be. A small boy bawls and runs to me crawling, crying. Ahle, 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 a child's cry. Someone has taken his toy bow. When I pick him up in my arms to hug him, he pulls back and looks inquisitively at the hole in my eyebrow and the scar rivulets on my cheek. I gaze back at him. I want to remember what the English Okla disease has done to him. Finally, I speak again. Are we not the Inholata, the ones who walk the thinking path? Do you agree that sacrificing myself to make peace with the Red Fox clan and the Chickasaws is a good decision? The child looks away from my face and follows the crowd with interest as they murmur softly to each other. Again, I wait for someone to respond. I search the crowd, anticipating the words that should be spoken. I wonder how Onatima, my mother's mother, managed to wait for months in total silence when she was unhappy with the speeches the men were making in councils. I still remember the day when she stopped speaking to me too. I'd offended her by stealing vermilion to paint my face. Onatima would not acknowledge me for weeks afterwards. That day had begun with an unusual event. A warrior was making a ceremony to his enemy in the center of Yanibi town. I was curious and wanted to watch while the other children were frightened and ran away. Even though I was young, I had known warriors who had been dragged off by marauding bands of English Okla. I wanted to see what would happen to me if I were captured by our enemy. So I watched and I waited. The warrior, Implat Tabi, kills it himself, jammed the head of his victim onto a post, then thrust his sharp blade into the soft flesh of the neck, fastening it to the wood. Then he painted his own face red, tied hawk feathers in his hair, danced and sang in a defiant gravel voice. Head man of the horse flies, you cannot stop what's coming. My face is painted so you cannot see me. I ravage, ravage, ravage. There I went along and you saw my tracks. Head man of the horse flies, my face is painted so you cannot see me. You saw my tracks and cried. Too late, head man of the horse flies, you cannot stop what's coming. Infat Tabi's cries washed over me like a soothing rain. To me, he'd become a magnificent bird. His hawk feathers kettled in the air just above his head, like amputated glory whirling in the wind. After his song, I was cleansed of fear. I remained with Infat Tabi, and my mother rested, wrestled me away to help a good father help gather food for our meal. I hurriedly collected corn, beans, and squash from our fields, then raced back to the center of town. Lapintavi was still there, but the head of the killed was gone. Disappointed that I'd missed the last part of his ceremony, I walked within inches of Impatavi. He was now covered head to toe in white chalk, signifying that he'd made peace with his adversary. He sat totally still and did not move when I touched his face. So that was not Toby, the something white. I'd overheard the elders discussing it many times, but until that moment, I had never understood what they meant. Ipla Tabi had slipped out of his body and into not Toby. In my eagerness to join him, I'd run back to Onatimi's cabin and stolen a small pot of vermilion and a knife. With a stick, I dabbed the red paint all over my face. I held my small palms out to Hashtali, whose eye is the sun. My feet moved in a circle and I stretched my arms like a soaring bird. Just as I charged back to show Implatabi, Onatima grabbed me off the path to town. Her mouth dropped wide as a scoop when she saw the knife clutched in my hand like a weapon and my face painted for war. She plucked the knife from my hands and mumbled ancient prayers. Her maternal belly sagged and heaved as she searched for the vermilion. I scrambled to find it, but it was lost. Mortified, I ran out of the yard and threw myself into the cold river and cried. 
as I wash the red stains from my face and body. After a month of endless silence, when it seemed to me that my shadow shrank a tiny, to a tiny reflection of itself, Onatima finally spoke to me. Come and sit by the fire, Alatek, my girl. Let's have a smoke and gossip about our cousins, the crawfish people. Have I told you why they call us the long hairs? My spirit revived. Being asked to gossip with the old woman was a sign I could again sit at her campfire. I believed the incident was forgotten, but I was wrong. When Onatima lay dying many years later, I offered her water and she refused me. Never steal from your family. We lose confidence in you and won't drink from your hands. Red is the color for warriors. What a terrible fate for a granddaughter of peacemakers. A wave of shame filled me so thoroughly I cut a lock of my hair to show my disgrace. This was the lesson I would not forget, one that I taught my daughters. Never steal from your family. Never wear the vermilion unless you plan to kill or seek revenge. I am living in a very different time from Onatima. Wars are more prevalent. The Alakichi, our doctors, can't cure the diseases of the invaders. The epidemic that ate my skin still tortures me. Patience is a thing I can no longer afford. At last I shout, do you accept my daughter's innocence? Yumak osh al pesa, replied one of the women. That is it. When I hear this, I am relieved. Then you also accept my decision to take my daughter's place in the blood sacrifice. Yumak osh ah pesa. The Inolata people honor your decision and we take Anolita into our hearts, she answered. On this day, I will follow our Choctaw ancestors to our mother mound at Nan Nani Waya. When released by the bone picking, I will grow and sprout up like green corn. From the mound, I will watch over our people. Do not cry for me, for I am a fast grower. Then my relatives repeat their pledge to me four more times. I'm scarcely aware of what I am doing after that. I turn to my brother, Nika, Nita Kechi, and ask him to invite the Red Fox people to eat with us. It is proper for them to join us in a feast, a final gesture of reconciliation. In a short while, he comes back with a large delegation of hungry red fox people. He motions for the men to move to one side of the yard and the women to the other. He brings a large pot of corn and deer meat soup and our guests use their hands like greedy spoons to fill their mouths. I watch my brother closely as happy red fox people wearing their finest regalia shove their way toward him expecting more food a young red fox boy begs for more and nita Ketchi dutifully walks to the fire to fetch more meat i hold my breath when i see how his hands tremble his eyes have the menacing look of a hatak appa a cannibal i know they are testing him trying to see if he really wants to make peace when he returns with a haunch of deer, our eyes meet briefly, and I hear him say to the pushy boy, yes, feed your hunger. Next time, you will feed me. Then he walks away on the verge of tears. I know why. He wanted to kill that child. For in Hilata, elders, this is heresy. For in, in Holata, elders, this is heresy. I admit, I do not understand that the Red Fox Clan of the Chickasaws, even though we are cousins. We share hunting lands and we understand each other's language, but unlike like us, the Red Fox people are envious and selfish. I think this explains why the victim hated my daughter. When she saw how beautiful Annalita was, she must have flown into a rage. I am told that the Red Fox woman ran at my girl like a rabid animal shouting, Isht aholo, witch, and throwing handfuls of rotting turkey heads at my girl. 
Jealousy must have consumed her. I can think of no other reason. Soon, four other red fox women captured Annalita. They held her down and cut handfuls of her long hair. Then they chased her out of their yard and pushed her into the swamp. Annalita had to flee through the murky waters and high grass until she reached a town within our district. The next morning, the jealous red fox woman was found lying on the floor of her cabin in a grisly mess. Her legs were spread wide apart and bloody. Her face was frozen in a sexed smile, as if delighted to death by the worker ants eating her. Cradled in the crook of her arm was her shriveled heart, torn from her body. At the time, I thought it was delicious justice. After all, they'd cut Annalita's hair and thrown her to the alligators. But the method of murder was not our way. Yenabi town people always aim for the head, not the heart. The Red Fox people were outraged and whipped themselves into a frenzy. They claimed Annalita had committed the murder in a fit of revenge. They demanded blood for blood. In preparation for war, the Red Fox dispatched 100 warriors and elders to seek the support of the Alibamu Kochatis. The Alabama Kuchatis are the cousins of both the Choctaws and the Chickasaws, and they often judge the disputes between squabbling tribes. An old woman who remembered our family sent a runner to Yanabi town to warn us that the Red Fox were crying for war. They were famous whiners. The Red Fox never missed an opportunity to turn misfortune into providence. Think of all the food they saved by eating out of others' hands. The night we received the news, Nitakechi lit the pipes in the council. He said the Chicksaw woman from the Red Fox village was dead because the English Okla wanted our land. How could this be? Women were the land. Intek Aliha, the sisterhood, controlled the rich fertile fields that sustain the people. Killing a woman for land would be like killing the future. Why would the Red Fox allow such a thing to happen, I asked. Because they are under the influence of the English Okla, who map their lands with the graves of women. They have convinced the greedy Red Fox clan that Annalita is a killer. If we go to war against Red Fox clan, the rest of the Chickasaws will join in the fight against us. Then the English Okla will devour everyone's land after we're all dead. The English Okla are somehow responsible for this woman's death. I believe it, said my brother. If the Red Fox people weren't so busy making brats, they'd see it too. I knew my brother was speaking the truth. The English Okla were evil. They had traded me disease for our corn. It was in their blankets, the ones I brought back to Yanabi town. The disease destroyed many of our people and napped my body like a piece of flint. Since then, I'd often dreamed of hanging English Okla intestines in the trees so everyone could see their shit. Kill them, kill them all, English Okla and Red Fox alike, I said. As for me, I will speak to my friend Bienville and ask him to join us in whipping out the Chicksaws. Nita Ketchi smoked a long time before answering me. He was embarrassed that I'd shown my true feelings, which was very improper for an Inholata woman. No, he said, it is better to negotiate. If we merely defeat the Red Fox, we will end up feeding them the rest of their lives and ours. Seven days later, Yenavitan sent 250 men from the Imklosha Iksa to the Alibamukachitis town. Our warriors strained at their feet, stained their feet and legs red and set fires to bundles of cane. They challenged the Red Fox to come out of the protective bosom of the Alabama Kochatis and die like men. We had to show our strength so that everyone, Red Fox and Alabama Kochatis alike, would want to negotiate. But I was told that the Red Fox laughed and laughed when they saw the warriors from Yanabi town. Who knows the humor of the Red Fox? Probably they laughed because, like dogs, they chitted themselves in fear. The Alabama Kochatis elders agreed to judge the conflict. I knew what this would mean. Feeding hundreds of mouths was a daunting task. 
I was told that even the council of leaders had to hunt so there would be enough meat to feed everyone. I could see, almost see, I could almost see the grandmothers and the nursing women with sick babies stirring pots of pashofa night and day, holding off bellies hungry for war. Everyone would remember this time as the costly season. My brother, sent as representative of the Inholata, was up against a flamboyant talker at the councils. As a red woman had covered her face in blue paint, as a red fox woman had covered her face in blue paint as a sign that she was telling the truth. She had monopolized all meetings. She repeated her claims that Analita had killed her friend. Niti Kechi had mistakenly believed that his audience could be swayed by logic. He explained that Analita was not a witch, that she knew nothing about conjuring the hearts out of people. He admitted that she might have improperly bragged about her husband, calling him the Imataha Chito, the greatest giver, the one who would one day unite the tribes. My brother explained that Analita was not a killer, nor was she jealous of the red fox woman. He used all the methods of peacemaking that had been passed down from grandmother of birds. He tried to explain that this incident was, not, was another plan of the foreigners to divide and conquer us. The foreigners will never be strong enough to destroy us. We will do it for them. He talked and cajoled the councils for council for out for four weeks until his voice grew hoarse. A long time had passed before my brother returned from the Alabama Conchatis. His face had the awful appearance of someone who had not slept for many days. He tried not to show his pain. He tried not to show his pain. I didn't listen carefully to what he said, just distant thinking. I already knew what he was going to say. The Alabama, Alabama Kachatis believed my daughter must be the killer because she and Red Fox women were both wives of the renegade warrior Red Shoes. The warrior we'd once taken into our hearts had grown into a giant Osano in the tradition of Hispano de Soto. Red Shoes always hungered for more. Often he would spy on our towns for the English Okla in return for trade goods and weapons. How had he hidden his true self for so long? That was a question I repeatedly asked myself. Several days before my brother's return, my husband, Koichito, had come to my cabin to present me with a gift, a porcupine skin. He had obtained it when he hunted with the Alabama Kachatis and the Red Fox warriors while the negotiations were going on to save our daughter. He reminded me that when our ancestors lived further north, they believed the porcupine was a, another symbol of the sun. He said that in the moonlight, the animal's quills seemed to radiate light a sign that one thing can hold the essence of another. Then he left. I realized why he had told me the story. It was his way of saying that nothing is ever lost. I had prepared the skin and stitched the stories of our seven grandmothers into a sash that I wrapped around me. I felt like it was my protection against what was coming. I told all this to Nita Kechi the day he was brought the news, the day he brought the news. We smoked tobacco and for the longest time talked of our family, of small things, the color of sky, the taste of this year's berries, the sweet smell of green corn in the spring. We also spoke at length about who the Imata Chito might be, Imataha Chito might be. I teased him by saying that the Imataha Chito was most likely a woman probably the woman in your dreams. I think it is time you found her and became her husband. He laughed, saying only, you are right. I reassured Nita Kechi that my decision to exchange my life for Analita's life was final, and I exacted his promise that he would prepare my body for the sa sca burial scaffold after the execution. When evening came, my brother said he would remember this day the rest of his life. He looked around my cabin and said, it's always been like this between us. I said, yes, it has, and it will be after my death. After carting the last basket of smoked meat to the Red Fox woman in my yard, women in my yard, I lugged pots of cool water from the oxbow pond for them to wash their hands in. 
This is my final lesson to my daughters, how to make inholata hospitality, in this case, how to host gangs. Finally, I go to find a comfortable seat away from everyone. I want to be alone with my thoughts. I find a pale wild onion pushing up through the dirt, narrow and bent. It is the last of its kind this season. I'm down to my own one self too. So I pull it up and bite into it. Pungent and tough, the onion kisses my tongue. <clears throat> the taste curls my lips into a smile. I turn toward the cypress trees. I watch the light cap them in blazing reds and yellows. The forest breathes heavily around me. At sunset, the bluebirds chitter in the tops of the trees. People and things I've forgotten come rushing back to me. Grandmothers planting corn, making pots, cutting canes for baskets, scraping hides, reciting morning prayers, singing sleep to tired children. I have long lived to see my own grandchildren. I long to have lived to see my own grandchildren, but this is not meant to be. I brush the dirt off my hands. It seems to me that an entirely different woman danced beneath these trees with my husband, Koi Chito, so many years ago. In those days, my hair streamed down my back and made a cape over my arms. Now it is thin and stringy like a starving dog's the effects of the disease. The night we met, I wore a short deerskin dress fastened around my breasts that left my buttocks partially exposed. At the time, it was fashionable for young girls to flaunt themselves that way. I felt beautiful when I stepped onto the dance grounds. There were so many dancers that night. I had to strain to hear the singers above the hundreds of dancers. When Koi Chito walked across my mother's yard and led me in the pleasure dance, I quit listening to the song and thought about him as a potential husband. I'd noticed him two seasons before, but decided he wasn't much. Too bony. He was already making children with an older woman from Yashu town. I thought he wasn't enough of a hunter to support two families. But that night, I changed my mind. He seemed mysterious and strange. He held my hand so tightly during the last dance that the juice of his palms crawled up my arms and entered my mouth like sweet vapor swallowing. I had tasted love. Koi Chito was a warrior from Im Imoklasha, the war clan. Since there were no rules against multiple marriages, I moved him into my mother's house. Within a season, my belly swelled in contentment. Analita was born, followed by Nashoba and Haya. The next 20 years he lived and hunted around our territory, providing meat and hides for us. It seems Koichito tethered my heart to his bone, skinny bones, and there I remain. I stretch my legs. They still ache from the English Okla disease. When all the sick and dying were placed in sweat tents, I prayed to the disease to kill me, prayed that my relatives would abandon me, prayed to the fire to smother me. After I recovered, I asked Neshoba to put Koichito's things outside of the door of my cabin. He picked them up and never returned to my bed. He understood that I couldn't bear to have him look at the disease under my skirt. Until the catastrophe at the Red Fox Village, I hadn't known why I had lived and others died. Now it is clear to me. I am to be the first warrior killed in battle against the Red Fox. Red Shoes and the Inklesh Okla must be planning to attack our town. Suddenly, I realize that there is so little time left. I have so much to do. When I reach my cabin, Haya is crying, gulping sobs. I pull her to me and tell her that she can close her eyes if she wants, or Neshoba will take her away before it happens. You can't go, mother, she says in a pleading voice. I will take Analita's place in the blood revenge. Chishke Apala, help me, mother. Nothing good will come of me after you are gone. I blame myself for Haya's nervousness. Before I had realized I had ma was making another baby, I had eaten too much rabbit. Too much rabbit makes a child twitch. It can't be helped now. All these rules for making babies, too much deer and you bring a child who runs away, too much cat, big cat, and you bring a child who turns assassin. I hope my girls remember all the rules. I put my head on Haya's shoulder. We've been through this before. All the reasons have been discussed. 
<clears throat> I try to comfort her. I tell her that she must understand she cannot stop what is coming. If I do what you ask, what will your uncle or your father think of me, I say. I gave you life, now I must go first. Analita and Neshoba and your aunts will look after you. You will never be alone. I motion for my second daughter, Neshoba, to come. Quick, quickly, will I still have strength? When she reaches us, I give grandmother stone to Neshoba. Take Haya into the forest, I say, and do not return until night has come. Then I kneel down and cradle my baby. Although Haya is no longer an infant, I still think of her that way because she is my youngest. I push the hair out of her eyes and kiss her again, inhaling her innocent breath. Then I give her to Neshoba. Haya begins to weep, but her sister takes her by the hand and I watch them disappear through the cane break. I want to run after them, touch them one more time, but I don't dare. I might yield. What I am, my essence, will live inside my daughters. Next, I speak softly with Analita. I tell her to use all the skills I have taught her. Ask our friend, Jean Baptiste Bienville, to fight Red Shoes and the English Okla. Bienville hates them as much as we do. I hold her for the longest time, and she promises to fulfill her obligations. Finally, I enter my cabin to remove my sticky work dress and prepare myself. I massage the swell of pockmarks on my sagging breasts. My arms are full of flesh and heavy as porous wood. The epidemic has chewed me to pieces. After today, I will be through with pain. I will put on my white deerskin dress and fasten the black and white porcupine sash across my shoulder like a shield. I rub my fingers over the threads and feel strangely calm. At last I understand why Anatima was so angry at me all those years ago. I was born into the peace clan, but in my heart I've always chosen a weapon. It is the reason I was attracted to the warrior Eplantabi and tried to imitate his war dance. The reason why my first instincts were to wipe out the English Okla for bringing us a disease. Why I now seek revenge. I decide that as a final gesture, I will show the people my true self. After all, I am a descendant of two powerful ancestors, grandmother of birds and Tuscaloosa. I dig around in my basket and find a pot of vermilion. Plunging two fingers in the paint, I mark my cheeks and spread the vermilion over my chin and down my neck the old fashioned way Iplantabi once stained his face. When I finish, I hoop Tushkapanya, a warrior's death cry. Then I hiss the words, Grandmother, do you see me? I will make the peace for you, but in my heart I want a war. When I walk out of my cabin, son of the Inholata women put, a face of sto put on a face of stone to hide their surprise. Others look down and squint at their hands, but clearly they understand. Dressed in white, with my face painted red, I have split myself in two. My message to my people is that we must fight to survive. Next, I address the red fox clan in my yard. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Koichito sitting, standing next to my brother, so he could not stay away. Like a warrior controlling my fear, I sing my last song. Headman of the horseflies, my face is painted so you cannot see me. You'll see my tracks and cry. Too late, headman of the horseflies. My face is painted so you cannot see me. Too late, headman. You cannot stop what is coming. The Choctaws of Yenabi town erupt in laughter at my insulting song. No one from the Red Fox village smiles. I look at Koichoto, and he beams with affection, nods his approval, and I continue. Headman of the horseflies, my face is painted so you cannot see me. I am the shell shaker, a descendant of grandmother of birds and Tuscaloosa. The actions I take honor them both. I am standing in for my first daughter, Analita, to make the peace. Italucci, autumnal equinox. On your day, when I sing this song, you will make things even.
the red fox politely accept my death in exchange for Annalita's life and agree that there will be no war between the Choctaws and the Chickasaws. In the presence of my family and all the people gathered in my yard, I stretch out on a long log, face down, close my eyes, and pray for courage. As is the custom, a relative of the red fox victim carries out the execution. A one-eyed elder named Imyatabi steps forward slowly with his war club. For the longest time, I hear him speak gentle words to the people, asking that the path be wiped clean between our two tribes. Then there is silence. I suck in my breath. I feel an icy hot explosion in my head, deafening. Blood gurgles from my mouth. My hands spring to my head involuntarily. Blood is seeping out of my head and flecks of bone are strewn through my hair. My arms jerk wildly like a wounded bird trying to fly away as the old man hits me again. I sense movement all around. Maybe Koichoto angrily knocks the man away. I feel my body twitch. Perhaps someone turns me over. I can no longer see. My head is unraveling. In that last moment, I have the burning desire to live and cling to the body. It is lean and compact. Koichito, ha, ah, he is here. I can feel him saying, give it up. I gasp for air and have no fear. I feel myself growing younger in this place. I grieve for my daughters when I hear their rhythmic wailings. I grieve for the red raw faces, teeth, eyes, cheeks, and black-haired people. I grieve for the seven grandmothers dancing in the distance as they shrink to almost nothing, then reappear as a flock of multicolored birds just beyond my reach. An unknown language floats around me. Each word is in an old code that I must decipher. Suddenly there are streaks of white and a delicious scent of tobacco fills the air as the spirit of an animal appears. Big mother porcupine walks into view and takes me by the hand. I open my mouth to speak, but my thoughts escape into the wind.